Okay, so hi everybody. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, shelling point based games and P plus epsilon attacks. So my name is William George. I do research for Klaus, which is a blockchain based decentralized dispute dis resolution platform. Uh, particularly, we use shelling points, so this research is very relevant to us. Uh, so I'm going to begin with an interesting thought experiment of Warren Buffett, uh, who wrote an article in 2000 uh, where he sort of bemoaned the state of US campaign finance law, uh, saying that it was too easy to make large do donations to political actors and sort of change US policy. Uh, and as a solution to this, he proposed, as a sort of farcif fanciful solution to this, he proposed a, an interesting thought experiment. Uh, he says, okay, well, suppose that some eccentric billionaire, not me, not me, made the following offer. If the bill that he was proposing, imposing strict restrictions on campaign finance, was defeated, if the bill's defeated, this person, the eccentric billionaire, would donate a billion dollars in an allowable manner, uh, because of course, with loose campaign finance laws, you can donate pretty much whatever you want, uh, to the political party that had delivered the most votes to getting it the, the bill passed. Uh, and then given this diabolical application of game theory, the bill would sail through Congress and cost our eccentric billionaire nothing. The idea being that both parties would be so incentivized to prevent the other party from getting a billion dollars, at, at a minimum, uh, that they would be strongly incentivized to vote for the bill. Uh, but it's because both parties would vote for the bill, well, then campaign finance laws would have changed, which means, well, all of a sudden, it's not possible to give such a large donation anymore because, oh, well, the campaign finance laws are more strict. Uh, so this kind of, kind of bribe, this structure, where you make a bribe that only pays out if you lose. If you don't get the outcome you want, is very interesting. Uh, and it's going to be sort of the, the theme of the subject of the rest of the talk. Okay, so imagine... Uh, to, I'll move back a little bit and talk about uh, shelling based, based point based games in general before, before moving back on to sort of these kinds of bribes and attacks. Uh, so imagine that you have a vote, uh, one of many votes, and you're given a binary choice between X and Y, and you want to vote with the majority for some reason. Uh, if you vote with the majority, you get a reward. And if you vote against the majority, you get penalized. Uh, and a priori, if you're just voting between X and Y, there's no context, like this payoff table here is symmetric. So there's not like a necessarily a canonical choice between voting for X or for voting for Y. Uh, but when there's context, when, when they mean something, then that might allow you to make a sort of a, a pick out a distinguished choice. Uh, so for example, this system, kind of at its base, is used by a number of, uh, of crypto economic systems, including Truthcoin, which kind of led to Ogre, uh, and also then Claros. Uh, so for example, in Ogre, uh, ultimately when you provide the, the response to a prediction market, uh, who won an election, who won a sporting event, you're rewarded if you vote, if, you, if you, your response agrees with everyone else's, agrees with the majority response, and you're penalized if you provide a response that disagrees. Similarly, in Claros, we're a dispute resolution platform, so we imagine that like, maybe you, Alice hired a freelancer, Bob, uh, and then there's a dispute over whether Bob did good work, uh, and ultimately some, some collection of people are voting on who was right between Alice and Bob. So in sort of those settings, X and Y have, have meaning. Like X and Y will be like who won the election, the choices between who won the election, or Alice or Bob, who was right in the dispute, and then when there's like an honest answer, when there's an answer that you can think of as being like the real answer in the real world, then you expect people to gravitate towards that. Uh, and this gets back to an idea of Thomas Schelling called a Schelling point, that when there's a solution in these kind of coordination games that people tend to use, uh, there are sometimes solutions that people will tend to use in the absence of communication because they seem natural, special, or relevant to them. Uh, so this idea of the honest answer being a shelling point, being a natural solution that people will tend to, uh, is kind of the underlying idea behind these shelling point based systems. So to illustrate this a little better, imagine we're in the case of a Alice v. Bob, uh, and there's some collection of people, voters, that are ruling between, on a dispute between Alice and Bob. Then if you're that guy in the middle, you have one of the votes, and you're trying to imagine, okay, how are the other people going to vote? Well, I think Alice is right. I analyzed her case. I, I think she has a good case. She has a stronger argument than Bob. And I, I think that the other two people are going to make the same kind of considerations that I am. They're going to like also analyze the case. They're probably going to come to the conclusion that Alice is right. Uh, so, and then they're going to think that I'm more likely to pick the honest answer, that is to say Alice being right, than not, if only because I think that they're more likely to pick the honest, an more honest answer is more likely than not. So then everybody thinks that everybody else will pick Alice, 
because it's, it's this sort of natural canonical solution, uh, and then everybody does, so Alice wins. Uh, so that's sort of the basic idea of how shelling point-based games work. Uh, and then there's this interesting attack against them, which is kind of a more sophisticated version of the Warren Buffett thought experiment. Uh, so this was kind of introduced in its form, in its uh, modern, more sophisticated form, uh, by a blog post by Vitalik uh, in 2015. Uh, where the idea is, imagine you have a payoff table where if you vote X, majority is X, you get P. If you vote Y, majority is Y, you get P. Otherwise, you don't get anything. Uh, and some attacker wants Y to be the answer for whatever reason. Uh, then what they can do is they can offer a bribe of P plus Epsilon, uh, which they only pay out to people who vote Y, vote with the response the attacker wants, if the ultimate response is X. Uh, so like the Warren Buffett attack, it only, you only pay out the bribe if your attack fails, if you lose. Uh, so then the idea is that, well, if, I've, if the majority is X and I vote Y, I get P plus Epsilon. I get P plus this a little additional amount Epsilon. Whereas if I'd voted X, I'd only have gotten P. Uh, and if, I, if the majority is Y and I vote Y, well, then I want to be coherent and I, I get P instead of zero. Uh, so all of a sudden, uh, the incentive structure of the game is warped. Uh, just by sort of offering this bribe, the attacker has, convinced, has, has incentivized everyone to vote Y. Uh, and then if everyone votes Y, well, Y will win, which means the attacker won't actually pay out anything. Uh, so in a, like, a priori, you look at this and you're like, oh, this, this is really bad because this is a free attack. The attacker can change people's incentives just by offering a bribe without ever actually having to pay one. Uh, so to illustrate, imagine Bob says P plus Epsilon attack available. Maybe he makes some kind of smart contract that commits to that bribe. Uh, and then everybody's like, well, you know, it's like I'll at least get a little bit better than I would have gotten otherwise. Uh, voting for Bob is now like a dominant strategy. So everybody votes for Bob. Uh, and Bob doesn't pay the bribe. So Bob managed to convince, change the outcome without actually paying anyone anything. Uh, so notice there are a couple of nuances here. So for one thing, if you think you have the decisive vote, well, then you're in a situation where like, things are a little different. So imagine this guy in the middle thinks, OK, one of my two other voters is going to vote Alice. One of them is going to vote Bob. So that means that I have the deciding vote. Either way I vote, that choice is going to win. So if I vote X, well, X is going to win. And if I vote Y, Y is going to win. Uh, so these other two diagonals in the path table sort of aren't relevant because they're not going to happen. Uh, I'm going to vote X and it's going to be X, or I'm going to vote Y and it's going to be Y. So ultimately, I have a choice between P and P. So from an economic incentive, it doesn't matter which one I vote. Uh, so the taking the bribe is no longer sort of strictly, is no, it's not strictly dominant. Uh, it's not strictly better for me to take the bribe. So that's interesting. Uh, and this can be generalized into a sort of counter-coordination um, defenses against people's supplement attacks. So this was already proposed in Vitalik's blog post. Uh, and the idea is that, say, Bob announces P plus Epsilon attack available. And say, these are the five voters. They can gather together and be like, OK, we're going to try to get it. We're going to try to like, def cheat the cheat. We're going to take as much money from Bob as we can and sort of engineer milking him as much, as much money as we can while he still loses. Uh, so what they do is they get, gather together and they counter coordinate. And maybe one of the five is does her own thing, she doesn't want to counter-coordinate, she goes off on her own. Uh, so these four people each provide a deposit to a smart contract, uh, and then the smart contract is going to try to engineer a narrow loss for Bob, with the idea being that if Bob, if Bob wins, he doesn't pay out the bribe, so that doesn't really help people. Uh, if Bob loses, but no one votes with, with the attacker, well, then Bob doesn't really have to pay out any bribes, because you only pay bribes to the people that take that vote with you. However, if Bob loses narrowly, uh, so here are there five voters, so if Bob loses like three to two, uh, then he has to pay out a couple bribes. Uh, so the smart contract tries to engineer that. And it's like, okay, well, I see that one of these five people isn't, isn't on board, so I'm trying to engineer and get three to two uh, loss for Bob. Uh, so I'll assume that she's probably gonna vote for Bob, and I'll ask one of my four counter coordinators to also vote for Bob, and the other three will vote for Alice. And that way, Alice will narrowly win, and Bob will have to pay out as many bribes as possible. Uh, and then if you think about who, what payoffs people have, well, first of all, if anyone doesn't vote the way they're supposed to vote, according to the counter-coordination contract, that you can slash their deposit. 
Uh, so you can give them a really strong incentive once they've agreed to counter coordinate and made the deposit to stay on board. So assume everybody votes the way they're supposed to. Then you can like think about okay, I get certain payouts from the coherence game, certain payouts from Bob, certain payouts from like the cuts, the, the counter coordination contract. So like each of these people that voted for Alice gets a payoff from the coherence game because they were coherent, they voted for the winner. Uh, the person who voted for Bob gets a bribe, uh, and the counter coordination contract tries to even them out. Uh, so it takes the, the people who like got a little less because they voted for Alice, uh, and it gives them a little more, and it takes the person who got voted for Bob and gives them just a little more, uh, so that ultimately they wind up with roughly the same thing. And you'll notice that they all get more than they would have gotten if everyone had just voted for Bob, or if everyone had just voted for Alice. Uh, so in a certain sense, they, they've globally done better. Uh, everyone has like better off for having done this. Except this person, this isn't a really stable situation because this one person who didn't counter coordinate did better than anybody. Uh, she got the full bribe, whereas everybody else got sort of like a part of the bribe. Uh, so from, her, from an individual voter's perspective, what you really want to happen is to be this person. Uh, you want everybody else to counter coordinate, but not you. Uh, you want Bob to lose, uh, but you to go off and take the full bribe by yourself. Um, so, like, you might take, you might counter coordinate if you expected that to make a difference in whether Bob ultimately wins or not. But if you think Bob's going to win or lose, sort of regardless of your individual actions, there's not a strong incentive incentive to get on board the counter coordination, uh, and you sort of have an incentive to try to go off on your own. Okay, so that's sort of what we knew before, as of Vitalik's blog post in 2015. So now I'm going to talk to you about uh, a defense against this, or at least a partial defense. Uh, so in Kleros, we use an appeal system. Uh, and the basic idea, even for normal bribes and normal attacks, is that if like Bob comes along and tries to bribe people, uh, like bribes two of my three jurors, what would be nice is if Alice can ask for an appeal. Maybe she adds, puts some, in, in some additional deposit, uh, and then um, somehow like the, the Kleros system will choose more jurors, more, more voters, uh, to rule on a given case. Uh, and then because there are more jurors, more, more voters, well, like, now it should be harder for Bob to bribe all of these people, uh, so it should become, like, less sustainable the more and more people you pick uh, for Bob to maintain an attack. Uh, and then the idea is that the token, the, 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 the voters, in Kleros at least, are, pull, are chosen by a token-weighted process. Uh, so if you draw more and more tokens, you appeal a whole bunch of times to draw more and more, more voters, ultimately you get you go from like a small number of people who vote to like a really large number of people that reflect sort of the broad token holding pool. Uh, and this is, in, so, and in order to like get a corrupt outcome, in order to, for, in order for like the broad pool of people to not ultimately come to a good decision, you would have to corrupt the broad pool. So not just some like, some selection of three or five jurors, but in order for your attack to hold up under appeal, you have to sort of be able to corrupt everyone. Uh, and this is really important to Claros because ultimately we envision ourselves as a general purpose dispute resolution platform and some disputes are hard. Uh, sometimes when you're trying to rule on a dispute you have to like really think about it and put in a lot of effort. Uh, and if we asked every token holder to put in that effort every time, that, that would be unsustainable. Uh, so ideally, usually you have a few people that make that effort. But then there's always this threat that you'll appeal and like have a larger pool of people. So you can get sort of the non-duplication of effort that comes with having a small panel of voters uh, by having an appeal system, while still having a security level that looks more like as if you asked everyone to vote. Because in order for an attack to succeed, it has to be able to win if you act eventually ask everyone to vote. Okay, so an early version, of, so the first launch of Claros, uh, was this thing called the Doge pilot, the Doge on trial pilot. So it's a curated list of, uh, of Doge images. So we wanted to start with something that was sort of low stakes and, and maybe gamified, where it's like to sort of test the crypto economic incentives in a, in a way, in a manner that like if things would go wrong, wouldn't have been too catastrophic. So the idea here is that we have a list of images of Doges, these Shibu Inu dogs. Um, and if, in order to get on the list, you're supposed to be an image of a Doge. Uh, so if someone adds an image to this list, the implicit dispute uh, is, does this image belong on the list or not? Someone can flag your image and be like, no, that's not a doge. That doesn't belong on the list. And then Alice is the person who says, this is, should be on the list, and Bob is the person who says, no, it shouldn't be on the list. Uh, 
Uh, and then we offered like sort of artificial incentives to get people to participate in this. Uh, we offered Dogecoin to people who submitted Doge images. We offered a, a, like a prize, a bounty, if someone could get an image of a cat on. Uh, so that way, people had both an incentive to attack and to propose honest submissions to the list. And we used this opportunity to do some experiments of people as Epsilon attacks and sort of see how they went. Uh, so, like, this image was one of the ones that we submitted as a people's Epsilon attack. Uh, you'll notice it has this block of text here at the bottom uh, that has a link saying, attention jurors, there's, there's a bribe potential. Uh, for more information, please, like, go to this, this link and find out more about the bribe. So that way, every person who had to rule on this case uh, would know there was a bribe. Uh, they would be able to see this, and they'd be able to find out more information. Uh, and we did this several times, and ultimately we see that, for the most part, people didn't really take the bribes. Uh, so none of the cases that, um, no, none of the cases had not Doge ultimately winning, uh, and in the most extreme case, about a third of the total votes voted for Doge. Um, so that, that's interesting, even though, like, People's Epsilon attack, like in theory, is at least sort of a weakly dominant strategy, unless you're counter coordinating. People didn't take the bribes anyway. Uh, and we have some more detail in terms of like, like analyzing these results. If you think of this as like a null hypothesis of people taking the bribe with 50% probability, uh, because ultimately it's sort of your, your baseline for whether the attack is to succeed or not. Uh, if you take the null hypothesis of people taking the bribe with 50% probability, then uh, it's, like it's like extremely unlikely we would have gotten results this extreme uh, with that null hypothesis. Uh, and also note that most of our token holders always either, all, either always took the bribe or never took the bribe, which is interesting because like, we offered bribes at varying levels, varying amounts. So most people either seemed bribe friendly or bribe hostile. Uh, so why did this happen? Uh, why, like, somebody, like, ask ourselves some questions of what happened. Uh, so for one thing, we think it might not be worth people, people to take the, like, the cognitive cost to understand the attack. Um, you have to like go read uh, Vitalik's blog post, uh, understand what a P plus epsilon attack is, uh, and then moreover, like the bribes can be smart contract enforced. You can have a smart contract that can like absolutely pay you the bribe if you accept the bribe, but like you know, that a priori the smart contract that this, the attacker is giving to you, uh, which necess hasn't necessarily been like audited, or for example, uh, it could be full of bugs and trapdoors. Uh, so, and particularly, you know, it's an attacker. It's someone trying to get a malicious ex uh, ex result through. So you don't probably trust them. Uh, so you want to check the smart contract for yourself, but that requires a lot of effort. You have to like really thoroughly read the contract. So there might, there's a cost to accepting the bribe in terms of cognitive effort. Uh, another possibility is our pool of jurors is just really altruistic. Uh, a lot of these people, uh, it's it's sort of. This, this happened in early days, so these people might were very people that were enthusiastic about Claros in at the beginning. Uh, they might not want to see a bribe successful against Claros. Maybe they held Cl Claros Panakion token already, uh, and they thought that the successful bribe would hurt the value of their token. Um, so that's a po it's a possibility that they just didn't take the bribe out of altruism, uh, and then if you th that might not stay the case in the future. Uh, so going to continue to sort of monitor how this evolves as the pool of jurors diversifies and becomes maybe more like the general population. Uh, and for more information about these kinds of our analysis of these specific attacks, we just published a book called Dispute Revolution that's available on our website. Uh, and you can read a more thorough analysis of, of these experiments in that book. Uh, so in terms of just cognitive costs and moral costs, already you note that if you add in that cost to the payoff table, uh, some stuff changes. Uh, so depending on how big your moral cognitive cost is, so you subtract off like a minus M here for voting Y, either for moral or cognitive reasons. Uh, so if M is like small, like really small, not a whole lot changes, which is, isn't surprising. Uh, if M is like gigantic, then you'll never, you'll never take the bribe no matter what, just because, you know, like if it, if it deeply offends your morality, you just won't do it, even if there's a financial reward for you. Uh, for like medium values of N, you can see that now the probability the attacker wins is no longer one. There, you're in like a mixed Nash equilibrium where the attacker doesn't win all the time, which means there's an expected cost to the attacker, which is much, much better than the sort of classical people's epsilon situation uh, because like it's one thing to have uh, an attack that like might work sometimes, but like the attacker risks a lot of money. So if the value of the case at stake is, is like 
not worth too much. And the, so it's like, say if it's like a $10,000 dispute and the expected loss of the attacker to like run an attack is like a million dollars, that, that's kind of okay uh, because like only a crazy attacker would do that. Uh, so that, that's much better than having an expected cost of zero, which is like sort of what the situation you had in the, in the classical P plus up stack. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about some design choices we made specifically to, in Claros to minimize the effectiveness of this attack. Uh, so there's a lot of complicated looking formulas here. I, I apologize. But imagine you have m total votes and each person has only one vote. Uh, that's an assumption that's not necessarily super realistic. Uh, each person places it a positive D. So now if you vote incoherently rather than just not getting P, you actually lose a deposit. But if you vote coherently, you get sort of other people's deposits. Uh, say little x other votes vote for x, little y other votes vote for y, and then your payoff table looks like this. Uh, if you vote for x and vote x, you get some share of other people's deposits that are split between the coherent people. Otherwise, you you get if you have similar for y. And then a people's epsilon attack is taking this formula and just adding epsilon to it as the as the amount offered by the bribe. Uh, and the reason this is helpful. Uh, is imagine you are in this special case where there are M voters in each round, they each put in their deposit, and all of them take the bribe, except for you. Uh, so there are M minus one that take the bribe, and I, I, I don't. And then my, kit, my side wins an appeal. Uh, X ultimately wins an appeal. So that person, under, these, under this design choice, gets everybody else's deposits in their round. They get M minus one D like M minus one deposits. So they're sort of a lone voice of reason and they get kind of a jackpot for that. Uh, so imagine these two people took the bribe or maybe they were just like, they thought Bob was, what should, should win for whatever reason. And this guy's like, no, no, it's Alice. And then Alice wins an appeal. That person not only has the, the sort of indication of having been right, he also gets the deposits of the other two people. Uh, so he gets, he, he's particularly incentivized to be right this, like even more so despite what people are voting in his round if he thinks he will be coherent with the ultimate ruling. Uh, so this sort of recaps what I just said. Uh, so this means that the amount of money the attacker has to lock up actually goes with the square of the number of voters because he has to, if the attacker wants to offer enough money to convince people to not defect and try to be the lone voice of reason, he has to offer everyone actually m minus 1d, which means because they're m jurors, he's offering m squared-ish amount of money, uh, and that's going to grow faster than the amount of, P amount of tokens locked up in the, by, the, by the voters to participate. Uh, so at some point, you actually get to the point where you, the attacker can't get enough tokens to pay everyone. Uh, in, with the parameters of our Doge pilot, beyond 13 rounds of appeals, which is kind of late, but it only, it only cost about 80 ETH to have appealed to the round 13, uh, the attacker cannot lock up enough tokens to, to, to make these people as epsilon bribes just because they don't exist. Uh, so that, that's good. Uh, we can revisit what, counter, what happens with counter coordination in this framework. Uh, so now imagine there are multiple rounds and the counter coordinators are sort of participating across multiple rounds. Uh, what the counter coordination contract tried to, try to do is try to get Bob to win by extreme margins in the early rounds uh, and milk as many bribes as possible and large bribes because Bob had to pay these people M minus one D in order to keep them on board. Uh, and then engineer a narrow loss for Bob in the last round. Uh, and then what happens, similar to the last time, people vote what they say they're supposed to, what they're supposed to vote, otherwise they lose their deposit. Uh, these people don't participate, so they'll just take the bribe, say, pessimistically. Uh, and now, like, these people get large bribes from Bob uh, because, like, they were participants in unanimous rounds in favor of Bob. Uh, these bribes are a little smaller, uh, but you, 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 Bob narrowly lost. Bob lost, lost four to three. Uh, and then these people, like, like, sort of there's a sharing of Bob's bribes between the two rounds. And then you'll notice that taking the bribe in the last round is not as good as counter coordinating in the last round. Uh, so if you're, if you're one of these people, like, you have no incentive to, to defect and, like, to not participate in the counter coordination. Uh, on the other hand, these people, like, this person did the best. Uh, so it's still not, like, it's still, there's still some sense of instability because this person who didn't counter coordinate in an early round and got the full bribe, the full gigantic bribe in that round, they did really well. Uh, but, 
like counter coordinating in the last round and later rounds is, is, not, is not as helpful. And then what sort of happened here uh, is that um, like you only need a few people up here to take the gigantic bribe to get to a point where a lot of sort of attacker money is sloshing around in paid bribes. And you can use that to average out in a way to get bigger values here than here. Uh, so you only need like a few people to counter coordinate in the early rounds to make the last round have counter coordination be profitable. So what this has done is basically leveraged altruism. Uh, altruism is now more effective than it needed to be, than it used to be. Uh, if you had a, um, like you only need, yeah, so I, like you, you only need a few altruistic people than, rather than a lot of altruistic people, uh, and a few people that can make a difference in terms of whether counter coordinating like, causes the counter coordination to win. Okay, uh, so the attacker can adapt to this. Uh, he, we have a couple of ideas of how the attacker can, can change his, what he does in order to like, preserve the ideas of a people less on attack without actually having to like, go through exactly what I just said, which turns out to like, not work super well for the attacker. So either the attacker can offer a bribe that only pays out in the last round. Uh, so if you take the bribe in an early round, you just don't get, you don't get the bribe. But if you vote with the attacker in the last round, you do. Uh, another possibility is to place a cap on what the bribe is paid. So that gives you a payoff matrix that looks like this. There's now a, there's now a cap bribe. Uh, and just uh, talk about the last round version briefly. The attack, if, you're, like, if you're an individual voter, you're thinking, OK, like, now rather than taking the bribe being dominant, I have to think, Am I going to be in the last round? And if so, taking the bribe is good, dominant at least. And if not, well, then I have to think of whether everybody else is going to take the bribe, and then tr if I should try to be coherent with them. Uh, so it becomes a sort of more complicated calculation for this person. Uh, and for the, we did a, an attack like this. It didn't work any better than the other ones. Uh, in fact, in the last round, it act, there was actually a lower percentage of, of people who took the bribe than in previous rounds. Go figure. Uh, so in terms of the capped version, uh, I guess I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Uh, basically, like, you wind up with a situation between the pure P plus epsilon and the sort of one round P plus epsilon, where you can still leverage altruism, alt like, be voting, like, participating as a counter coordinator uh, is more effective than it would be if you didn't have an appeal system, uh, but not as effective as it is in a pure version of this, of this attack. Uh, so then, and you wind up in sort of a mixed equilibrium. Uh, so the voters have to think it's like, I should vote for the attack with some probability, which adds a level of complication. So then to just to conclude, we already thought that cognitive costs were an obstacle in taking people's ups on attacks to begin with. That was one of our, one of my, probably the stronger defenses. Uh, and then, well, because pure people's ups on attacks are sort of harder, like less effective at least against well-designed appeal systems, an attacker can adapt to versions that preserve the spirit of the P plus epsilon attack, but are even more complicated. So the cognitive costs are even higher. Uh, so then, because cognitive costs were already good, they should, even be even, like, should, they should be an even better defense with an appeal system. And of course, we're going to do more experiments. So, so uh, Thank you. Uh, it gets quite c complicated, which is quite interesting. Um, one thing about the moral costs that I want to ask is, do you include reputation or effects to reputation and moral costs? Because I think that that's usually like, it's a personal thing, like I'm not the person that accepts bribes, but mm -hmm. maybe it's more important for them to say like, I don't want to be seen as a person that takes bribes. So a priori, no, uh, at least not for now. Uh, can, so like, a priori, so we don't have a reputation system built into Klaus, at least for the moment. Uh, so, like, in theory, you're pseudo-anonymous, pseudo uh, but, you know, maybe, maybe at some point, but e even despite that, uh, like, it seems that, so either because of the cognitive costs or because of, you know, for, like, be between some mix of cognitive and moral costs, people nonetheless, even if they were pseudo-anonymous, didn't, like, seem to have some opposition to taking the bribe. Uh, even if it's just some kind of private morality. And uh, another question is, um, have you studied these kind of bribing attacks, P epsilon attacks in sort of uh, base layer blockchain protocols like proof of work mining, uh, people considering bribing miners to do certain things? If, have you guys looked at that at all? 
Yeah, so there are equivalent attacks in terms of private miners. Um, so I, I haven't thought about how like how like an appealable mining system could work in terms of trying to repair that. Uh, but but yes, there are that th those kinds of phenomena exist. Awesome, thanks. Hi, thanks for the presentation. So I have a, a few questions. Um, uh, are there any other attacks to a shilling game uh, based oracle, or do you think this is the major attack uh, vector for shilling game oracles? So the other um, sort of attack that specifically targets kind of shelling protocols are uh, attacks, sort of pre-revelation attacks, where you try to influence people's votes by having already saying that, you know, like announcing your vote, and then if other people want to be coherent with the final answer, they'll be like, ah, this person already voted. Maybe I should vote the same way too, because like that, like I can already see there's at least one vote in for that person. Uh, so you'll notice that like that, like the idea of counter coordinating. Like there's already some, you know, like you, you have, there's some implication that you know how other people are going to vote when you're counter coordinating with them. Uh, so we have ideas on how to defend against pre-revelation attacks. And again, the appeal system is sort of the best defense uh, because if you're, if the attack is someone shouting, "I'm going to vote for Bob," "I'm voting for Bob," you know, if you vote with me, like we'll already be two out of three and be coherent. Well, if you're, all, if you only get rewarded for being coherent with an eventual appeal then you don't really care about being coherent with that guy saying he's going to vote for Bob. You care about being coherent with some future pool of jurors and some future round who haven't even been drawn yet. Uh, so, like, that, that is already a defense. Uh, and then, to the degree that we need to, like, sort of defend mutually against people with Zeppelin attacks and anti-pre-revelation attacks, like, there, there are things you can conceivably do where you, like, counter-coordinate from a different address and you make, like, some kind of zero-knowledge proof or something that you're, like, one of the voters. But uh, so, yeah, that, that's the other sort of shelling specific attack. Cool. And I have a few more questions. I mean, they're kind of general. So, okay. So, Sorry. Um, first one is um, Does this change in a system where you have identities? So, where you uh, for example, possible to restrict uh, it for one vote per person? And, um, and then the second question is Do you think that shelling game based oracles are the best oracles? It's kind of general. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, much. so with regard to having only one vote, um, so like a priori, as soon as you have this fixed pool of, pa this panel of like n votes uh, that are trying to coordinate with each other on a shelling game protocol, uh, there's like this attack is, is there regardless of whether you're one person, one vote, or having a larger pool of people. Uh, that some, of, some of the edge, edge phenomena are a little different, but like the, the, the basic idea is the same. Uh, and what kind of oracle is best is probably situation dependent, but shelling oracles are, you know, one of the one of the natural things you can do in this this kind of scenario. Thank you. We have a break uh, till ten.